By now, the three brethren had been unworn for almost half a century. Anton was its sixth owner. To the Fuggers, the jewel was a measurement of power, as it had been to the Valois Dukes. But to Jacob and Anton, it represented something to be locked up, a secretive wealth. By the time Anton began the sale of the jewel, it was 1547, and 70 years since Charles the Bold had been slaughtered on the fields of Nancy. Anton's buyer was Henry VIII of England, and he would have worn the jewel if he could. The king's appetite for the knot had been whetted by ye for years by reports of its beauty. His own sickness didn't weaken his desire. By the new year, he was dying. But in his January accounts, Anton recorded the payment received from England. Weeks later, the king was dead. The brethren would have suited Henry. He was the Tudor's minotaur, a bull of a man in a political age, losing through lack of subtlety everything he gained from strength. His brute hunger comes through in portraits. He looks as if he is always about to bite. Henry was photogenic three centuries before the invention of the camera. Like the brethren, he was a crude and effective power. He was a man characterised by hungers for alcohol and progeny, meat and land. His appetite for jewels was inexhaustible and after the Catholic Church was sacked, he had the wealth to buy at will. The heaped gold and silver Henry extracted from the monasteries weighed in at 289,768 and 7 eighths ounces. And he spent as if his health depended on it. By the time of his death, jewels and wars had reduced England to the brink of bankruptcy. It took five years for the Fugger dynasty to complete the sale of the jewel. Aged 14, it was Edward VI who committed the brethren to the Lord Treasurer in June 1551. Within two years, the child king himself was dead. The brethren was delivered to bloody Queen Mary on Hallamas Eve 1553, and on her death, five years later, pregnant with tumour, praying for it to be a Catholic child, to her younger sister, the Protestant Elizabeth Tudor. There is a painting of Queen Elizabeth in Hatfield House, Hertfordshire. It is called the Ermine Portrait, after the stoat which sits on the Queen's arm. It is a political portrait in the old style, the Queen surrounded by her treasures, a show of potency to the powers across the water. In this picture, the Brethren is the broached centrepiece of the Queen's black, jewelled skeleton. Elizabeth's maid of honour, Elizabeth Bridges, appears in a similar portrait by Hieronimo Custodis, painted three years later. In her parure of jewels, she looks as insignificant as the water vessel in a still life. The jewels cover her like flowers and butterflies and moths. The human figure has faded, its character smothered in those of the stones. It is a mannequin in jewels. The Virgin Queen is more substantial. Her eyes are small and quite hard, like those of the ermine poised on her sleeve. It is nearly three decades since she gained the throne. The assassins sent for her from Europe, finding themselves inexplicably assassinated. It is two years before she orders her cousin to be killed. Elizabeth, like the brethren, grew into herself with age. When Elizabeth gained it, the brethren was 150 years old. It took this time five generations before a woman owned the jewel. Bloody Mary was the first, but Elizabeth was the only one with the leisure to enjoy it. Five generations, in an age when jewels were worn as by, by as many queens as kings. I wonder why it took so long. It seems to me that the character of the three brethren is masculine. 
the shoulder knot of a cloak, worn for battle, a jewel plain as a piece of armour across the collarbone, functional as the blood groove of a sword. It is beautiful in the half-ugly way that certain men are beautiful, angular, muscular, dulled. It has that hardness. There is a sexuality to it, the rubies warm to the skin, the diamond cool. I know this is a fallacy. There is nothing human about the brethren. It is eight stones connected by a single metal element. Still, I wonder how it felt when Elizabeth wore it, its heaviness on her breasts, physical, like a hand. It suited Elizabeth. The monarchy of England was growing rich on trade and piracy, and the Queen's jewels gauged and reflected its strength. Elizabeth's possessions came to include the Sancy diamond and a rock crystal bracelet from the workshops of Emperor Akbar, which is now the earliest surviving piece of mogul jewellery in the world. In Elizabeth's 1587 inventory, it is described as of rock crystal set with sparks of rubies powdered and little sparks of sapphires made hoopwise called Persia work. There were jewels on her fingers, jewels in her hair. In her coiffure, Elizabeth wore a spinel the size of a baby's fist. This was the Black Prince's ruby, which is now set in the Imperial State Crown of England. Under Elizabeth, England had become a repository for jewels. They were pure power. Armies held in waiting. Fleets of ships in the making. And at their heart was the three brethren. It was already old, even then. Its inch of pointed diamond remained harder than anything the world could discover. <laughs>